Hi again. Uh, let's review together Chapter 8, uh, the heart and the blood vessels for the human system, human biology course that we have at FGCO. Um, we all understand from uh, the lecture we had that we have uh, two circulations. One of them we call the pulmonary circulation and the other one is the systemic circulation. And you see here kind of both of them, although the, the uh, uh, pulmonary circulation is not showing the lungs, which should be here. All you see here is the pulmonary artery feeding into them and then the pulmonary veins uh, will drain the lungs back into the left atrium and that completes the pulmonary circulation whereas systemic circulation if you remember we agreed that the venous the venous return come from the superior and inferior vena cava uh, those end up in the uh, right atrium and from the right uh, from the right atrium to the right ventricle before that, uh, the systemic circulation starts with the aorta and from the left ventricle. So the aorta is pumping the blood and uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the left ventricle is pumping the blood. It's going to go through the aorta, the ascending end and the aortic arch. And then it splits into different arteries into the systemic circulation and it keeps getting smaller and smaller the big size artery will give smaller size medium size and then small size arteries ending up with arterioles and the arterioles are going to end up with little capillaries the capillaries are going to have the exchange of nutrients and waste at the tissue level also the exchange of gases unloading oxygen and picking up carbon dioxide and then the capillaries are going to carry this blood with all the waste back into the venules and from the venules into the veins and from the veins it unites big size veins that go back into the superior and inferior vena cava and that completes the circle because these guys are going to empty into the right side of the heart, the right atrium, and the right atrium, as we know, is emptying to the right ventricle. So, that divides our blood vessels into arteries, veins, and capillaries. The arteries are those vessels that are carrying the blood away from the heart, and they transport blood under significantly high pressure, although the pressure fades away as you go away from the heart. Now, the capillaries, on the other hand, they don't have muscle layer, they only have a single layer of endothelium, which is simple squamous epithelium, and that allows the easy exchange of gases and nutrients, also water, as you will see in a little bit. The veins, on the other hand, they have similar structure to that of the arteries, with two exceptions. One of them is that the muscle layer is not that significant. Also, the connective tissue layer is not that significant because they don't have that much tension. The pressure inside the veins is significantly lower than the pressure inside the arteries. The other significant difference we had when we went through our lecture is the fact that the veins have inside built-in valves which allows the blood to go into one direction and prevents the backflow of the blood and we will see how important this is for the venous return to the heart. So, the structure of the arteries, keep in mind that the arteries are any vessels, any blood vessels that are taking the blood away from the heart. We're going to call that the arteries. It's not the quality of the blood or the kind of blood, but it's the direction of flow. If the blood is leaving the heart through those vessels, then these are arteries. If the blood is returning to the heart through other types of vessels, these will be the veins. So the structure of the blood vessels, the arteries, the thick-walled ones will have three layers. The innermost will be endothelium. This is common for all of them. And the middle layer will have smooth muscles. This is also common for all of them. And the outer layer that varies, the connective tissue, the elastic, and the dense irregular tissue, it will vary whether the blood vessel can withstand too much pressure or is designed to withstand too much pressure or 
it's relatively low pressure vessels and in this case you don't necessarily need too much connective tissue because nothing is going to rupture it so you're relying more on the smooth muscle layer and the structure of the endothelium at that point the arteries the function of it is to carry the blood away from the heart it carries blood under pressure but we also agreed the closer you are towards the heart the higher the pressure so Blood flow goes from the heart to the arteries, to the arterioles, to the capillaries. The arterioles are the smallest of the arteries. They're less than 0.3 millimeter in diameter. They lead, these arterioles, they lead to the capillaries, but they don't lead automatically. They have the ability to shift the, the, the flow to the capillaries of choice. And as we discussed in the lecture, the, the, the arterioles, the terminal arterioles, they have something called pre-capillary sphincters, pre-before capillary sphincters. So these are valves right at the opening of the capillaries, and they can switch the blood flow whether that particular organ or tissue is in demand for more oxygen, and therefore those pre-capillary sphincters can open and allowing more blood to go to those capillaries. If the tissue is not in much demand, then that flow of blood can be shifted to more important targets. And we compared it at the lecture to the irrigation of a land, and where if you have one river and 2,000 lots, all of them are on the banks of that river, it really depends which lot will get the water. If you have vegetations and vegetables that demand lots of water, then you would like the water to flow from the river to those lots, whereas if there are residential lots or if there are lots that has that have uh, absolutely no plants in it, you would rather not waste your water irrigating that piece of land pretty much the same idea. You have limited amount of oxygen and you would like to save the oxygen and the nutrition to the areas that really need it. You, if, if you're working your muscles, then you are saving the oxygen to the muscles. If you, um, if you are in trouble in with the circulation, you would like to maybe um, withhold the blood going to the skin and shift the blood flow to vital organs like the heart, the, the, heart, the, the brain, the kidneys, uh, because you want to spare those organs from destruction if you are in short supply. And you are uh, capable of doing that by a process we call vasodilation, which is dilation of a blood vessel, and vasoconstriction, which is the cons constriction of the blood vessel. That controls the flow, but it can also increase the blood pressure because the smaller the passage, the higher the pressure. And we talked about it on the lecture. If you have uh, a, a tire that has a tiny little hole and you sit on it, the pressure in the tire is going to build up because the passage of the hair is uh, passage of the air is limited. Whereas if you have a big hole, the pressure immediately will drop because uh, the air will have no resistance whatsoever. And it's the same thing with the blood flow. If the blood is allowed to go without resistance, without much resistance, you will realize that the pressure is low. So you can really regulate your blood pressure by alternating your um, tone in your blood vessels in the arterioles to go up and therefore blocking the flow. And when you block the flow, you increase the pressure or you can dilate the arterioles and therefore the flow will have no resistance and when you have no resistance for the flow then the pressure is going to drop this is how the manipulation of the pressure takes place and also the manipulation of the perfusion of a tissue takes place where the blood that's going into the arteriole will be decided whether this particular tissue here is in demand for that supply or not and that's based on the carbon dioxide the pH this tissue is producing whether and the temperature and whether or not those uh, sphincters will open up and therefore allowing the blood to perfuse this particular area. 
Nevertheless, nevertheless, whatever blood passing through the capillaries is going to drain into the venous end of the capillaries and from the venous end of the capillaries into the venules and from the venules into the veins afterwards. Now the capillaries, these are the smallest blood vessels. They're thin walled. They only have the endothelial layer. They don't have muscles. They don't have connective tissue. Why is that? Because you would like the exchange of gases and nutrients to happen there. The more layers you put, the impossible your task would be to allow the nutrients and the gases to exchange very quickly. Keep in mind that the blood doesn't linger around in your vessels. It just keeps going and you want your exchange to happen in milliseconds. So the structure again, it's the smallest of the blood vessels. The capillaries are, they're thin walled, one layer, simple squamous epithelium, and it has little pores between the cells. And that allows for things like water and water soluble molecules to pass between the cells. In some areas, like in the kidney, we have larger holes that allow much more things to pass through. Now, extensive network of capillaries, we will call that capillary beds. The function of the capillaries would be selective exchange of substances like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrition, picking up waste. All of these will happen only at the level of the capillaries between the blood and the interstitial fluid. So this is the structure here of the capillary. And as you can see, in some tissues, we have more porous capillaries than others, especially in the kidney, for example. But nevertheless, we have only a single layer. First of all, the diameter is very small, and we have a single layer of endothelium lining, and that's it. No connective tissue and no muscle layer either. So the flow, as we agreed before, in the capillaries from the arterioles is dictated by what we call precapillary sphincters, which if it closes, then it's not going to allow the blood to go into the capillary bed. If you open it up, then more blood will go to the capillary bed. What happens in the capillary bed is that the oxygen will go through by diffusion because the oxygen has no problem passing through uh, a phospholipid bilayer. In the meanwhile, water and other water-soluble molecule will go through holes and channels in, those, uh, in the wall that is made by the endothelial cells into the interstitial tissue. Now, the waste and the carbon dioxide and the excess water, all of them can return into the venous side of the capillaries and from the venous side of the capillaries to the venules. Now, excess water and bigger things like proteins, which are enabled to go here and maybe little cells and uh, dead bacteria or whatever, all of these cannot go back through the capillaries. So you will learn in a little bit then th that the interstitial space that we see here is also drained by something else called the lymph or the lymphatic system or the lymphatic vessels. And those lymph are capable, lymphatic vessels are capable of taking larger molecules because they have bigger gaps between their lining, their endothelial lining, than what you see here in the capillaries. And just like the exchange between the blood and the interstitial space here happened through the capillary wall, there will be another exchange between the interstitial space and the cells themselves where oxygen will go to the cells and carbon dioxide will be collected. Now, the veins. The veins will be draining your capillaries, first the venules and then to the veins. The veins have three layers, just like we learned before. It has the endothelial layer. All of them have the endothelial layer. It has muscle cells and it has connective tissue fibers. Connective tissue fibers are not as extensive as the, as the arteries for the reason that the arteries withstand a lot of pressure, whereas the veins don't really uh, take that much pressure. The veins, on the other hand, are easily distensible. They're like balloons. They can take lots of uh, fluid. They can take a lot of uh, blood in them. That's why like two thirds of your blood is actually in the, vein, in the veins, in the venous circulation. So when you would like to take that back, you do what we call venoconstriction, 
where the veins will constrict and therefore the blood that you have as reservoir there uh, will be bumped or, or reserve will be pumped back into the circulation so you can get use of the blood that is uh, lingering around for a little more inside the veins. Now the function of the veins is to carry the blood towards the heart from the capillaries to the venules, from the venules to the veins, and from the veins to the heart. It serves, like I said, as a blood volume reservoir where two-thirds or so of the blood is actually present inside the veins. Now, if you remember, the, the blood flows from the arteries. So first of all, when it goes into the big arteries, the pressure is around 120 by 80. 120 is the high pressure, 80 is the low pressure. When you go to the arterioles, the pressure is significantly lower. The pressure in the arterioles is constant at about 40. There is no high, there is no low, it's just constant at 40. When you pass through the capillaries, then the pressure drops to about 10 or so. When you go to the venous side of the capillaries, the pressure is really low at around 5. And so you would like that pressure to be pumped back into the heart, which is a challenge. Now, a lot of factors will help you with this task to bring the blood back into the heart. The muscles are associated because the muscles will squeeze on the veins, especially when you're walking, when you're contracting and relaxing your muscles. That will act as a peripheral pump to push on the blood inside the veins and the blood will gradually will go back to the heart. Now the other thing that is important is the fact that these veins will have valves in them. So whatever you push up, it's not going to go down again. It, it allows only unidirectional flow of the blood inside the veins. Now the third factor is the negative pressure when you are taking a deep breath. There is negative pressure inside or taking a breath period. There is negative pressure inside your thorax and the negative pressure is going to act as a vacuum to help the blood moving towards the thorax where your heart is. So these are the three factors that will help you with completing your venous circulation knowing for sure that there isn't that much pressure to allow the blood to flow on its own without this help from the venules all the way up to the heart. Okay. So this is a circulation and this is the comparison between the different types of blood vessels. Here is the large sized blood vessel. You'll see a lot of connective tissue, a lot of muscle layers, and then inner layer of endothelium, which is common in all of them. Now when you go to the arterioles, you will see you don't have the connective tissue layer. You only have smaller layers of muscles and you have the endothelium. You go to the capillaries, you lose the muscle layer. You go to the venules, you have the endothelium, the muscle layer, and the tiny little bit of connective tissue. You go to the large size veins, you see also a tiny little bit of tissue, mainly elastic, and um, a middle layer, which will be a smooth muscle layer, and finally the inner layer will be endothelium. A significant difference here in the veins will be the presence of valves. It's the, only, it's the only blood vessels you have with built-in valves to allow only the unidirectional flow of the blood inside them. Now, like I said earlier, the drainage that happens over here, so here are the capillaries, the red is the arterial side, the blue is the venous side, and so the, the exchange will happen here at the tissue level into the interstitial space and then to the cells. Now, not everything is picked up back by this ca these capillaries on the venous side. So a lot of things are too big to pass back and so, or too much to pass back here. So for that, you will need another drainage system, another sewer, and we call that the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system will help you maintain the blood volume. It assists in the function of the immune system. It drains the tissues for you. I gave you examples of getting a blockage or removing the, the lymphatic circulation because of tumor after 
uh, surgery after tumor like breast cancer and removing the lymph nodes then the skin starts to uh, draw a lot of water because nothing is draining it as, effic as efficiently as in the presence of the lymphatics. So the lymphatics are very very important in draining the excess water, in draining the cells, in draining um, the proteins and it's also important because whatever gets drained will go to a sewer treatment plant, lots of them, and those are called lymphatic tissues. Now inside the lymphatic tissues, as we will learn later on in the immune system and as you already learned at the lectures there are cells immune cells that are waiting and hunkering down to attack any foreign invasion that you might be draining bacteria that you drained maybe macrophage that has been fighting and now they're expressing some uh, some uh, antigen pieces on their uh, major histocompatibility complex on the surface of the macrophages. So all of that is capable of stimulating the immune response. Now the lymphocytes are really sitting down and waiting for action in those lymph nodes and the lymphatic tissues. So we go now to the heart and the structure of the heart and we can see from from this here as we see here the left ventricle and over here we will have the right ventricle and we will see the, I'm sorry, the left atrium. And we see here what we call interventricular sulcus. And between them we have blood vessels. And here is some of the coronary blood vessels that we're going to learn about later on. The, the heart has a conical shape. And we call this part here the apex, which is primarily made by the left ventricle. So let's talk a little bit more about the structure of the heart both on the outside and the inside, as well as the function of the heart. So if we open up the heart a little bit, we'll realize that the heart has four chambers. On the right, you have right atrium, right ventricle. On the left, you have left, left atrium, left ventricle. Now you can't let the blood mix together and the blood will go only in unidirectional flow. You can't allow the blood to go back, forth, back, forth. So it goes into one direction and then it's prevented into going back by those valves. We have valves between the atria and the ventricles, and that allows the blood only to go from the atria to the ventricles. We have one on the right and one on the left. The one on the right that allows the blood to go from the atrium to the ventricle, but not on reverse, has three flaps, three cusps, so we call it tricuspid valve. Now the one on the left side, it has only two cusps, two flaps, now we call that bicuspid valve. Now the other two valves are at the major at the entrance of the major arteries. So we have one here, which is at the entrance of the pulmonary artery, and we have another one here at the entrance of your aorta. The one at the entrance of the pulmonary artery will call that semilunar valve, the pulmonary semilunar valve, which is different structure than the structure you have here. These ones are flaps, these ones they are like half moon shaped, more like pocket shaped, and we call that semilunar valves. We have one at the pulmonary, so that's the pulmonary valve, and we have one at the aortic opening, and we call that aortic valve. These valves are very important. They maintain the unidirectional flow of the blood. Now the blood is going to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle, from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, it goes to the lungs, it drains back into the pulmonary veins, it goes to the left side into the left atrium, from the left atrium it goes to the left ventricle, from the left ventricle to the aorta and so on. Now, other structures that we need to look at, here is the aorta and here is the, here is the aorta and here is the pulmonary artery. We also have the major veins that drain your systemic circulation back into the right atrium and we call these guys the superior and the inferior vena cava. Now inside the heart we'll realize that the left ventricle because it pushes against higher resistance has thicker walls sort of like your muscles if you are practicing certain muscles those muscles will be thicker because they have hypertrophy and the same thing here because of the resistance that the left side of the heart has to overcome the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, is significantly thicker than the right ventricle. 
Those valves, in order to prevent them from flapping and um, flipping back to the other side, they will be anchored with those guy wires into the muscles. And those wires here will have a name. We call them cordy tendini. They will be connected to muscles that look like little mountains or little nipples there. So we call them papillary muscles. So the function of the papillary muscles and the cordy tendini is to prevent these valves, those flaps of valves, from everting to the other side and therefore preventing the backflow of the blood into the opposite direction than that intended by the valves. Sounds good? The structure of the heart, just like any mobile organ inside your system, you would like to make sure that it's protected. You wrap it up. You wrap it up with pericardium, peri around cardium heart related. So the layers of the pericardium is the epicardium, which is the layer that is really tight on top of the heart. It's still part of the pericardium, but it's the one that's stuck to the heart. Then it's the muscle layer of the heart. That's the myo. Myo means muscle. And the endocardium is the innermost layer, and it's also endothelial lining, just like the endothelial lining you have inside the arteries. The heart will have two four chambers, we talked about that, two atria, two ventricles, and the valves will prevent the backflow. Two valves between the atria and the ventricles, the one on the right will be the tricuspid valve, and the one on the left will be either bicuspid or the mitral valve. We also have valves at the entrance of or the beginning of your major blood vessels, so we're going to have the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve both of them are semi-lunar valves, whereas these guys are flap-like, and that's why we call it cuspid valves. So this completes the circulation. Like I said before, your blood is collecting from the systemic circulation. It's going to go to the right ventricle, to the right atrium, from the right atrium to the right ventricle, from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, from the pulmonary artery to the lungs, and then it drains to the pulmonary veins. It goes to the left ventricle, from the left ventricle to the left atrium, and so on. You need to remember, however, that these passages happen at the same time. In other words, at the same time the right side of the heart is pumping the blood into the pulmonary artery. It's the exact same moment the left side of the heart is pumping the blood into the aorta and into the systemic circulation. By the time the blood returns from the lungs back into the left atrium, it's the same time the right atrium has been filling from the superior and the inferior vena cava. At the time when the tricuspid valve closes, it's the exact time as the bicuspid valve closes. The time that the aortic valve closes is the exact same time as the tricuspid valve closes. I don't want you to think that the two parts, the right side and the left side, are working independently. No, they're working exactly at the same time. They're synchronized to be exactly at the same time. Okay. This is the pathway I just told you about it. So the deoxygenated blood is coming from the superior and the inferior vena cava to the right atrium. From the right atrium, it goes into through the atrioventricular valve, or what we call the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it goes to the pulmonary artery. It gets oxygenated. It returns to the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins are going to empty into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it pumps the blood or it actually just allows the blood to go into the left ventricle through the bicuspid or the mitral valve. And from there, it goes through the aortic valve uh, into the aorta and into the systemic circulation. So this is the deal. This is how the circulation is completed. And the arteries, as we know, will lead into the capillaries. The capillaries will drain and will give you the exchange and will drain into the venules and from the venules to the veins and the rest of the circulation you are very familiar with. The structure from the outside, the heart, just like any tissue, imagine the heart is beating every minute about 50, let's say 50 or 60. Multiply that by how many minutes in the hour multiply that by the 24 hours, multiply that by how many days your life is, you will realize that the heart demands a lot of 
oxygen, a lot of energy, and that will be maintained by those blood vessels you see here, and these are called coronary blood vessels. So we have right and left coronary blood vessels, and they will be accompanied by coronary veins. You will ask where the coronary arteries are coming from. They're coming from the base of the aorta. That's where they are emerging. And then the veins, on the other hand, are going to empty into something called venous sinus, and that venous or coronary sinus, and the coronary sinus is going to empty into the right side of the heart, into the right atrium. So this is a little circulation here that it's intended to feed the heart as a muscle, as a pump, because also the heart, of course, needs to um, be fed. Interestingly, from this picture, um, this here, uh, it's called, uh, it's, it's a little ligament that attaches the aorta with the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary artery. And it has a story, you don't have to remember the story, but it has a story that this one used to be an actual tube. And the tube is called ductus arteriosus. And that ductus arteriosus, when you were an infant, you, it allows the mixing of the blood between the arterial blood and the venous blood, uh, or the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Now, this has to close later on, or else, of course, if it remains, and we call it patent ductus arteriosus, then it leads to problems later on. You don't have to remember the part I just shared with you, but it's sort of interesting how it's illustrated here, this ligamentum arteriosus between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Now, as the heart is contracting, it's going to push the blood, and as it pushes the blood, that raises the pressure inside the blood. Whenever the ventricles are contracting, we will call that ventricular systole. Whenever the atria are contracting, we call that atrial systole, although most of the textbooks don't really recognize this as a systole. Uh, they only recognize the ventricular systole or the ventricular systole. So we're going to focus more on the ventricular portion of it because that's really what matters when it comes to the blood pressure. The atrial contraction is not that important. It's not even important for emptying the atria. You don't have to contract the atria in order to empty the atria. The blood generally goes 70 to 80 percent of the blood will go from the atria to the ventricles without even having to contract the atria. Uh, but the ventricular systole, we're going to focus on it. The diastole, or the diastole on the other hand, is the state of relaxation, and generally it refers to the state of the ventricular relaxation, not the atrial relaxation. So people tend to accept systole, or systole, as the ventricular contraction, and diastole as the ventricular relaxation and they disregard the whole idea of the atria uh, whether it's contracting or not that's irrelevant to our cycles so this is the diastole and the systole and what's more important of course is the ventricular contraction which we call the ventricular systole now when the blood passes from the atria to the ventricle, we are ventricles, we are agreed that the blood is not going to be able to return because of the presence of valves. And those valves are called atrioventricular valves. On the left, we have the bicuspid or mitral. And on the right, we have the tricuspid. So the blood goes from the atria to the ventricle. And the, tri the blood, when the ventricles contract, will try to go back into the atrium. It's not going to be allowed, so that goes a slam shut of those ventricles, and that will create the first heart sound. So in other words, the first heart sound, the love sound in your heart sounds, is really created by the closure of the atrioventricular valves. Now the love sound will happen after the end of the ventricular contraction. Because at the end of the ventricular contraction, the pressure inside the ventricles will drop. And that will allow the pressure inside the major arteries, the pulmonary artery, and in the aorta, to exceed the pressure inside the ventricles. So the blood inside the aorta and inside the pulmonary artery will try to go back into the ventricles. And that's not allowed because we have the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. 
that will cause shutting of those two valves and that produces the second heart cell. So, in other words, the first heart cell is really created by the systole, which is the contraction of the ventricles. The second heart cell is created following immediately diastole, which is the contraction of the ventricles. Sounds good? These are the major two sounds. There is a third heart sound and fourth heart sound, which you can only hear if you have very, very special equipment. But if you have just the stethoscope, you only can hear the first and the second heart sound. Now, if there is irregularities, if there are irregularities, if you have valve problems, valves that don't shut, valves that don't open, then you can, or very thin blood, or too much blood, you will start listening to irregular sounds, and we call those irregular sounds murmurs, heart murmurs. Now, the heart is unlike a muscle, which demands a nerve to tell it to contract. Now, the heart pumping all the time, whether you want or not, it's an automated pump. So it has its own pacemaker, and that pacemaker is situated in the right atrium, not very far from the opening with the superior vena cava, somewhere there. So we call this area sinoatrial node because it's next to the venous sinus or the coronary sinus opening, and it's in the atrium, the right atrium, not the left, the right atrium, and that will fire on its own. It will keep firing and auto-stimulate your heart. And when it auto-stimulate, this wave will stimulate the atria. When it stimulates the atria, the atria will contract. Then it goes to the next step, and at the AV node, at the junction between the atrium and the ventricles, the AV node, it's another door that this impulse, this electric impulse, has to go through. That's the only way from, for the impulse to go from the atria to the ventricles. Now the AV node will say, no, you can't come in, and we compare that in the classroom to the bouncer. I will say, no, you can't come in because we don't have seats for you. So you stay here a little bit, it delays you a little bit until the ventricles are ready for you. So the part in the conduction that's really responsible for the delay of the impulse is the AV node. Once it passes to through the AV node, then it will go crazy and it's going to stimulate the ventricles, both of them are the same at the same time, very quickly through the AV bundle, uh, bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers to stimulate the muscle of the ventricles so the ventricles will contract to eject the blood out of them into the pulmonary and the aorta, the pulmonary artery and the aorta through the right and the left uh, respectively. So. Here's the conduction system, as I told you, the SA node or the sinoatrial node is the pacemaker of your heart. It keeps firing impulses. Those impulses are going to travel without a problem through the atrial wall. But comes to the atrioventricular septum here, they're only allowed to go through this door and this door only, and we call this door the AV node or the atrioventricular node. It delays it a little bit, and that allows the atria to contract, empty the blood, and then after a milli few milliseconds, then the ventricles will be capable of contracting. So this is really good because we don't want both of them to contract at the same time. If this happens, then the ventricular filling would be affected, and you would like the ventricular filling to only take place after the atrial contraction has ended. Okay? I'm sorry, the ventricular contraction to take place after the atrial contraction has ended. Okay? You can track these changes, these impulses, whether it's changes in the electricity in your body that reflects the contraction of the atria or those that reflect the contraction of the ventricles. You can put electrodes all over the body in special places and monitor those changes and it will give you three big characteristics in this what we call electrocardiogram. One of them is called the P wave and that will reflect the depolarization or the contraction of the atria. The second one will be the QRS complex which will indicate or reflect the depolarization 
and the contraction of the ventricles. And finally, the T wave, which is the relaxation or the repolarization of the ventricles. Sounds good? You need to remember the P, the Q, R, S, the T. So let's have a picture here, a look at the picture. Here is a P, and here is, here is a P, I'm sorry, and here is the Q, R, S, and here is the T. The P wave will be the depolarization of the atria, the QRS, the depolarization and contraction of the ventricles, and the T wave will be the relaxation of your ventricles. Now, if there is any abnormalities, you can see here, for example, ventricular fibrillation, you can have also atrial flatter, you can have arrhythmia, you have ectopic uh, beat, all of these can be diagnosed with putting a person on ECG or EKG. Some people pronounce it ECG, some people write it as EKG. Either way, it's electrocardiogram. All right, here is the same picture again, showing you the P wave, the QRS, and the T wave. Once again, the P wave will be the depolarization and contraction of the atria, QRS, depolarization and contraction of the ventricles, and the T wave will be the repolarization of the ventricles. Now, as the ventricles are contracting, now we're going to focus on the left ventricle. We're going to ignore the right ventricle for, li for a little bit because we're talking about the systemic circulation here and the right ventricle doesn't really apply to the systemic circulation. So we're going to focus more on the left ventricle. As the left ventricle is contracting, the pressure is rising inside the left ventricle and then the pressure is rising inside the aorta. As the pressure is rising into the aorta, we call this pressure the systolic pressure because it reflects the time when the ventricles were in systole or in systole, which is the contraction of the ventricles. And this is what we usually refer to as the high pressure. So the high pressure or the systolic pressure will be a reflection of the contraction force of your left ventricle. Now the diastolic, it's a lower pressure and that will be due to the elastic recoil, the elasticity of the major blood major arteries pushing the blood through the arteries after the cessation after the ending of the ventricular contraction so it really is a pressure that is maintained when your ventricles are not contracting when your ventricles are in a state of what we call diastole ventricular diastole you can measure it with sphygmomanometer and we did that in the classroom and you practice that to measure the high end and the low end or what we call systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. Now people can have high blood pressure and that's called hypertension and people can also significantly low blood pressure below 90 we're talking about the high here 90 by 60 and that can be low blood pressure or hypotension both of them can have problems one of them can lead into significant damage in the tissue, and that's the hypertension, and hypotension will lead into um, insufficient uh, nutrition that's reaching organs, vital organs like the uh, brain or the kidneys, and that can also lead to problems. All right, you need to realize the highest pressure is in the major arteries and when you start going into smaller arteries and into the arterioles you realize that the pressure is in the arterioles is ranging around 40 and it's constant it doesn't go more up or down not like the fluctuation you see here once you get to the capillaries the, con the pressure is constant it doesn't fluctuate then you go to the venules and the pressure inside the venules and the veins is really really low around 5 or 10 and um, all the way up to 20 or so and we agreed that the pressure is being pushed back into the heart by three factors the presence of valves inside the veins by the muscular contractions the, 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 the skeletal muscles contraction and pushing the blood back into the heart and also by the negative pressure exerted by the respiration by the inspiration inside your thorax and that acts as a vacuum to bring back the blood into the thorax. Now the pressure of course has to be regulated. You have to maintain constant pressure. You can't allow the pressure to go crazy on its own. So you have to install baroreceptors or pressure receptors, pressure sensors, 
and those will be, some of them are in the carotid sinus, in the carotid artery in your neck, and some of them in the aortic arch, which is part of the aorta that curves around, if you remember the model that you studied. So if the pressure rises or falls, if the pressure, let's assume the pressure rises, then it will alert the baroreceptors that you have too much blood pressure, and that will alert the parasympathetic stimulation, I will tell you that, wait a second, you can't have this too much pressure. So easy on the contraction of the heart and easy on the tone of the blood vessels. So you drop your blood pressure to control it. You don't want your blood pressure to go out of control. On the opposite end, if the blood pressure drops down, you would like those baroreceptors to fire and say, wait a second, where is the blood pressure? Where is the pressure? We have low pressure here. And that will fire the sympathetic system, and the sympathetic nervous system will cause constriction of the blood vessels, and that will increase the resistance. And when you increase the resistance, that also increases your blood pressure. At the same time, you can increase the force of contraction of the heart, and that increases the systolic blood pressure as well. So this is how you fix the blood pressure, and those are the baroreceptors. As we agreed, some of them are in the carotid, arteries in your neck and some of them are in the aortic arch. Now the centers for those are present in the medulla oblongata and the medulla oblongata if you remember from the nervous system it's the continuation of the brainstem in, uh, inferiorly after the pons between the pons and your spinal cord you will have the medulla oblongata. Um, you don't have to Remember for now the, the hormones that are secreted, but the nephrine, the epinephrine, and uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, they are coming whether through the sympathetic circulation, uh, th through the sympathetic nervous system, uh, the fibers themselves, or they are secreted into the blood by a big gland we're going to learn about in the endocrine system called the suprarenal gland. Exercise definitely helps and allows the blood flow and the cardiac output because, of course, that will increase the requirement of your tissues. Now, there are disorders that can happen. Angina pectoris. Angina is pain. Pectoris is the pectoral region. So you have pain in the pectoral region. And that is due to ischemia. Your blood is not reaching certain areas of the heart. And that can due to different factors. Some of them, the most common of them, is one of the coronary, coronary branches is clogged or it has uh, a thickening of the wall of some sort and that doesn't allow the blood to go into the muscle as it should. Uh, if the ischemia lasts for too long, then that cardiac muscle will start dying and we call that infarction. That's what we call a heart attack and that's irreversible damage to the muscle and if the heart starts not to pick up its function as it should as a pump we call that heart failure if it happens on the right side and therefore you have venous congestion we call that congestive heart failure the presence of little plugs going around in your blood we call that embolism and finally a stroke is impaired flow into the brain and that can happen because of embolism mainly or because of um, a blood clot that has originated in an artery that feeds your brain and that of course causes the stroke. Uh, you don't have to go into extreme details uh, at the human biology course in understanding the myocardial infarction but just for kicks there is intense chest pain felt mainly on the left shoulder and the inner side of the left arm and the diagnosis it can be diagnosed with the EKG or ECG you can also look for cardiac proteins like um, uh, uh, troponin troponin is not supposed to be in the blood but if you start to see that in the blood that can indicate an infarction. You can prevent it by exercise, you can prevent it by uh, eating habits, controlling your weight, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, don't take too much saturated as fatty acids, observe your intake of uh, 
of uh, cholesterol and fatty acids, and especially if you have history, your father, your grandfather, your uncle, you have a history of heart attack, then you need to be more cautious about it. All right, and I think this is the last uh, piece of our uh, lecture here with the circulation. I hope you enjoyed this review, which is a reminder of you of the functions of the heart and the circulation and the structure of the different blood vessels and the different chambers inside the heart and the, the different valves and the function of those uh, areas and the maintenance of the blood pressure and all the things we did cover in the lecture. So I hope you do well in the test and again this is a, a, a quick review for you to hopefully help you ramping up those chapters. Have a good day.